to turn the thank you okay we'll uh, go ahead and call this meeting to order we'll start with welcome and introduction can we start with a roll call please uh we don't have andrew uh he he was uh replaced and we have uh not appointed anybody else in his place so uh tony uh, will be the chair uh for this meeting and and he is currently the acting council chair without uh, uh without uh the chair so i will start with him uh tony here here okay uh micah chappell here chill anderson present caroline Traub. here cory I think I Here. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five. We have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you, Stoyan. Anyone from the public that would like to be recognized? Yeah, Larry Andrews, Andrews Mechanical. Thank you, Larry. And good morning, everyone. Terry Beals uh, representing Sound Transit, just listening in today. Welcome, Terry. Uh, Tim Adbury with the Associated General Contractors of Washington, just listening in. Welcome, Tim. Adam Hutchinson, Northwest Concrete Masonry Association, listening in. Thank you, Adam. And we send the invite to all council members, and I see many council members are here, and uh, I appreciate that. We wanted to uh, start with the introduction of this uh, uh, report slash final cost-benefit analysis a couple of days per, uh, before the council meeting, just to let them get familiar with it. Thank you, Stoyan, for that clarification. And then let's go ahead and go on to agenda item number two, which is review and approve the agenda. Is there any discussion on the agenda? If not, looking for a motion to approve. Move to approve agenda as shown. This is Corey, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion to approve from Micah, a second from Corey. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any against? Motion carries. Let's go ahead and go to agenda item number three, review and approve the minutes from March 16th. You had a chance to look over those. <clears throat> if there's any changes, go ahead and speak up. If not, looking for a motion to approve. This is Corey. I'll make a motion to approve the January 28 minutes. We have a motion. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Micah. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Uh, that brings us to item number four, cost benefit analysis, WSEC commercial from Ecotope. Uh, so we'll have a discussion and public comment on this. We also need committee action on this today. And so, um, Stoyan, do you want to lead off on this? Yes. So uh, why we are here? Uh, staff developed the preliminary cost benefit analysis, which is a requirement under the Administrative Procedure Act. We used the data provided by the proponents. Uh, we have a contract with a third party, to, in this case, it's uh, uh, Ecotop. Ecotop's scope of work was to evaluate the preliminary cost benefit analysis, make corrections if they find data that is not applicable, uh, provide uh, options if they have options on the cost benefit, take into account comments received during the uh, public hearings in the comment period and uh, uh, modify the preliminary cost benefit analysis and their report, their work would be used for uh, the final cost benefit analysis, which is also a requirement under the Administrative Procedure uh, Procedures Act. We need to have this in, the, uh, uh, in our file. Uh, most of the comments were evaluated uh, by Ecotop. You, you see the report, I can move up and down to whatever section uh, uh, you want. We listened 
a lot of comments, testimony, uh, and uh, this is the last meeting and we intentionally kept it uh, at the last moment because we wanted to do, we wanted to give Ecotop more time to evaluate uh, the comments that were received. Our plan uh, for uh, the final cost benefit analysis, again, we will add to Ecotop's report, we will attach the comments that were received. Keep in mind that the cost benefit analysis is always subjective. Um, you, you ask nine people, you get 10 different opinions on, on, uh, on, the same, on the same subject. And I'm judging by experience here. So uh, this is where we are. Uh, the cost benefit analysis was used and will be used by the council members to uh, make their decisions on Friday. It's not, uh, they won't rely 100% on the cost benefit analysis, but this is a major part of the rulemaking. So uh, uh, this is what we have. This is still a draft. We'll call it a final draft because during the meeting on Friday, we may have some modifications uh, to the energy code and uh, we will have time to uh, align the final cost benefit analysis with the modified language. Okay. Uh, Storian, is Ecotope present today? Uh, there is a person who will be on a listening mode and she'll make, she'll make uh, uh, notes and uh, uh, Henry will join us uh, a little later if, if there are specific questions for him. Uh, the, uh, the reason for this meeting was to, if we have new comments, but not to repeat that everything everything that was said. Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, Henry will join us a little later. Okay. Okay. Is 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 there anyone here from Ecotope to present what's been changed in the report or what the new re this report contains that the other one did not? Or is that something that you you were going 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 to go over? I can, uh, well, that's not my best area of expertise, but uh, I, read, I read the report and, and I think uh, the information is there. Uh, the, the, the question you're asking is, is there. So what, what the report, the report has the summary, okay? So what was the executive summary provides the information what was changed, okay? This is uh, 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 on page four and Further in the report, there, there are more details uh, regarding, uh, give me a second to get there, or right here. Okay, so you can find the findings here uh, and you can see right here, the cost analysis and the energy analysis, you can see the, the Ecotop updates. Okay. So uh, he, he, Henry, I didn't join at the beginning because he has uh, conflicts uh, uh, with the schedule and, and his and my understanding, so I'll put myself here to take the blame, was that uh, these questions were already uh, uh, addressed. So again, with the last minute notice, he will join later. Okay. Um, with that, let's, um, let's start with with committee members, is there any discussion among committee members at this time about the the final report? Well, I guess I'll ask some questions. I unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the minutes don't show our questions previous, and I know we all had several. And I <laughs> and sadly, I've had too many meetings between this last meeting and for this report and now um, I, I really would like somebody from Ecotope to go over what was modified and how those questions were addressed. Uh, I mean, you're asking for a vote on this, a vote of approval and, and move it forward to the full SBCC, but I don't know if the questions we had, which were significant, I believe, and I don't know how things were modified unless they highlighted that in the report and I don't see that. Um, and then, of course, like I said, I I know we had questions, but they're not reflected in, in the minutes. Um, and so I don't know if they've been answered in this report because I'm sorry, I don't remember what all the questions were. Uh, 
but if there's no way to show or identify, you know, what was changed or what was modified here, I, I'm, I know Stone, you mentioned it as being in the executive summary or something else, but I'm not seeing, hey, this is what we changed based from the last meeting or some information there. So I, I need more information from Ecotope at this point. That's where I'm at. I don't know about the rest of the committee. So that's for me. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Um, is there, I'd, I'd like to open it up further for committee members and then go to public comment. My concern is, is that, is just that, I guess, at this point, I was, I assumed, and that's on me, but I assumed that Ecotope would be here to just do a final rundown. And I'm a little taken aback as to why they would not be present at today's committee meeting. Um, is there any way to take a 10 minute adjournment and call Ecotope and have someone in the room? Because I just feel like it's significant enough that we need Ecotope in the room. I, I just, I don't know how we do this without them here. Okay, let's take 10 minutes break. I'll try to reach out and find out. Okay, I'll make a motion for a 10 minute adjournment. Um, come back at 10.22. If we can just adjust that to 10.25, I'll second that motion. Adjusted, so adjusted, yep, perfect. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, so moved. We'll be back at 1025. Really get a hold of him, sorry. Uh he he joined the meeting. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And, and uh can I can I have 30 seconds? Uh yes. So I, I guess I wasn't clear with what, what I was saying. So we when when the council is this includes the, the council staff when i say we you know the council staff needs to do the work too but so when the council is filing uh adopting or you know doing any type of uh, rulemaking we need to comply with the administrative procedures act section 34 uh, this section requires us to have the preliminary cost benefit analysis and also the final cost benefit analysis it both needs to be available okay we hire the third party because we don't have the workforce and we don't have the knowledge to develop a cost benefit analysis based on energy code proposals. These are more specific. It needs special knowledge. Okay. If we don't have the Ecotop report, we have nothing, which means the staff or the work group of economic impact or the entire council needs to prepare the final cost benefit analysis. That's, again, I'm not advocating or doing anything. I'm just stating the procedure. Um, I'm not, I'm not knowledge, knowledgeable enough to evaluate the Ecotop report. I, I just don't, but my point is we do need the final cost benefit analysis. So if we don't have Ecotop report, we need to develop something else. These are my 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Storian. I and I and I think that's understood. I think the main concern was is if we were going to um, if this report that just came out, that being that there's new stuff on it, we just want the we just want to understand what those things are. And so and we would like to entertain those. And so I think that's the, the key concern. So um, okay, so let's pick back up. So um, we started with with uh, committee comments and open it up for discussion among the committee. Um, I'm okay, good. Uh, do you want me to show the report on the screen? Yes, please. That'd be great. Okay. Again, just let me know which section and I will move up and down. Um, is Ecotope able to speak to, um, if we start with them and kind of speak to some of the, the, the items that they addressed in this final report uh, based on discussion from our previous meetings. And I think that gives us a good starting point. Um, Micah, would that kind of start to, okay. 
All right, I'm seeing yes, so. Sure, uh, hi, yeah, this is Henry with Ecotope. Uh, sorry to hold everybody up there. My fault, I was uh, double booked, so. No, that's okay, I'll thank you that. for joining us, Henry. Appreciate yeah. it, especially on short notice. Um, yeah, so I can give you a pretty high level rundown of some of the major changes. Um, I think the gen general intent for our third party analysis is to add kind of more, more information, data analysis to kind of the overall package that's in front of you today and also in front of SBCC. So um, it was it is not in our intention to have captured all the comment, uh, the public's concerns. Um, we address some of the comments received, both in written, written writing and as well as uh, verbally. And so um, I'm hoping that this is just another component to what everyone considers. Um, I'm not trying to uh, over, overstate uh, what our results are or uh, assume that we've addressed everything. Um, so with that, uh, if you scroll down, Stoyan, uh, one of the biggest updates that happened um, that rippled through um, all of our LCCA was we uh, summarized the, the assumptions using the tool. Uh, where do you want me to? Uh, right here? Table two. Table two. So it stated what we used in our LCCA runs. This comes from the state. Um, so that just shows our utility price as well as the uh, discount rate. Uh, the biggest impact this had was on the heat pump water heating proposal. Um, the low price of natural gas for commercial buildings um, uh, updated the results and impacted uh, the payoff, even including the social cost of carbon. Um, and instead, we've shown the, the cost impact as a per unit, um, per dwelling unit estimate um, for the heat pump water heating proposal. Um, one of the main comments we've received from multiple parties in general in this is that there's so many different system and building types um, in the commercial sector that these two especially the space heating proposal and the heat of water heating proposal impact um, if you scroll down another paragraph here still in we kind of mentioned this here that each code proposal was reviewed on building by building um, it's incredibly difficult to capture every uh, variation across the state and every system and building type with this. And so while our analysis on the heat pump water heating proposal does show a cost impact with this proposal, um, we at least made an effort to both identify the building type being a multifamily building as the most energy intensive um, in the water heating end use, as well as the most complicated system. So for multifamily building, uh, yes, there is a cost impact, but for a lot of simpler systems like the integrated heap of water heaters you find at Home Depot, um, those are relatively easy to design and install. It is a cost um, increase over a, a gas tank, but um, it's a bit more straightforward um, in terms of getting that into like an office or a really small um, apartment unit or whatnot. Um, so yeah, updating the Price of gas was uh, impact on the end result for that one. Okay. Um, Henry, real quick, before we get too far, I just want to make sure that we're still on a topic while Mike has, has his hand up. Sure. Thanks, Tony. And that would be kind of my question. Do we? Do you want us to ask you questions, Henry, as you go through some of these things? Um, if so, on this specific table, the input parameters you have here, were those, is that standard? Is that something that Ecotope decided? Um, is that something from the state that we require? In other words, the study life is 50 years. I know in the PNNL study that you referenced several times throughout your report, um, it seems like they have also provided a, a memorandum with a table where their study life is 30 years. Could you explain why the difference was used here? Um, and why PNL is using something different and you're referencing something from them. It just, just where did you get this input data or input requirements for this table? Sure. Yeah, that was, this was one of the main um, requests from DES and we were uh, brought on was to use um, this standard um, life cycle cost tool put out by, 
I think it's DES or Department of Commerce. Um, and so these inputs you're seeing here are standard per the LCCA tool. Um, I'm unsure if someone else on this call could speak as to who decides this or how frequently it's updated, but um, you can actually find these inputs if you go to the energy code uh, proposal form. There's like a little hyperlink in part of the lifecycle cost and it'll it'll link you to this this table here. There's one for commercial and one for residential. Perfect. That, that's the information I needed. Thank you. It's just where, where are you getting that direction from? And it sounds like Department of Commerce and that works. Appreciate okay. that. Great. Yeah, so this, this is uh, one of the bigger uh, updates and it's good to get that feedback. And so all three of our revised LCCA runs are using this information. Um, and so, and just to touch on the heat pump water heating proposal once more, there was a review by McKinstry, um, which I hope is also provided with this report. And they had a good note that um, city of Seattle and King County already require heat pump water heating systems in multifamily and commercial buildings. And so um, technically this state level code proposal does not add a cost burden to a very significant portion of uh, the building stock, especially new commercial construction. Um, when you think of mid-rise, multifamily, and high-rise uh, systems like that. So um, that's kind of what I try to touch on here. It's just a single building by building. It does not carry weight over the entire building stock across the state. And again, it's just this one snapshot. So um, just want to clarify that. Uh, if you scroll down, Stoyan, um, the space heating proposal, um, aside from the LCCA inputs update, nothing really changed here. We had what the proponent provided in terms of their TRC study and what we had found uh, via the PNNL research and that um, two other references. Uh, what I did do is I did pull out information both from the proponent's baseline system, because that was a valid valid system to base the co-proposal off. And I also pulled um, some costs I could find from another report for the VRF, and I put that into an LCCA run, um, just as a means to at least try to close the loop a little bit on kind of piecing together some other uh, published research. We didn't do any modeling or cost estimating our own for this one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a pretty complicated proposal. So we took what we could um, and still kept it on a single uh, building type, which is a medium office. The nice part um, is that uh, all the studies used the same DOE prototype for medium office. So um, it was at least kind of the same square footage um, and a lot of occupancy schedules used in modeling um, and came to same result that uh, we had before but I just put together a analysis using the state's LCCA tool. Mike, did you have something further? I did have a question on this. You indicated that you did some additional LCCA runs. Are those included in this report as part of Appendix A, or are you just providing a synopsis of those in this specific section? It should be in Appendix A, figure three. Okay, so those are the modified ones that are based based on that information. Yeah, the okay. first the first pass through, we just kind of threw out what we saw, some like a narrative, of what okay. we could pull from our resources, and so this revision, I went in and uh, just tried to put that information into that tool just to see, uh, uh, you know, what the uh, assumed cost of gas and electric kind of how it comes out. So okay, great, thank you. Um, there were comments on the electrical. So if you go to the next proposal, Stoyan 21 GP1, uh, 179, one more down. Um, there were comments on, uh, this is the one electric receptacles about uh, not the full cost of all the infrastructure upgrades were included. Um, since this doesn't have an actual payback, um, those our valid comments. Um, I hope uh, those whoever submitted those is submitted alongside with this, but since there's no payback, it didn't seem 
uh, really any reason to include that into this analysis because we come to the same results anyway. Um, again, that was mainly our approach is to see if we agree or disagree with the proponent's result. Um, there's a lot of information we could gather and um, enhance this kind of analysis. But um, And then the next one below is the CMU walls. Um, again, went back into the LCCA, made sure all the inputs were the same. We got the same results. Um, I remember someone was confused by the EUI showing up in our LCCA versus uh, the Kennedy report. And what I did was remove the floor area from the prototype and I normalized the energy savings and costs per 1,000 square foot of wall area. And so this way you'll see if you compare the two, the overall uh, present value of the savings and the LCC, LCCA run will be smaller, but that's just because instead of trying to take some, you know, prototype and estimate the total wall area, I just did it per 1,000 square foot. Um, this is similar to Kennedy's approach. I think he did it per square foot. Um, so I just added a factor onto it just to get a more kind of realistic um, dollar value and energy savings. Um, so again, same results as we had before, uh, just kind of shorted up the LCCA to be hopefully a little clearer. Um, and that gets the next two. And then aside from that, we did not receive um, any major comments on other proposals and um, our preliminary, if you go to table one, would probably be your best going up, up, up at the very top. Our first pass through all the other um, code proposals, we either were uh, pretty confident in their results as well as the sources, um, or we didn't receive any uh, direct comments on them. So that's that's the summary of our of our uh, analysis. Um, if anyone has any other comments or questions, Bill, did you have something? It was can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I guess I was just looking at the, the proponent used a discount rate of 70%. And I was assuming that was a typo or something like that. Cause that's a, was, was that, is that true? Henry, it was a 70% discount rate. I think the tool comes with it. Um, but 70%. Use... That's <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure why that's in there. So the tool has the standard inputs, which actually aren't aligned with what the energy code slash SBCC wants. And so I can see how some confusion could happen. Um, and I think when you open up the tool, if you go to user adjusted inputs, it defaults to 70%. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Okay, but you use the 1.93. Use the 1.93, I use the cost provided just in their table, um, the proponent's table, and then I use the energy savings from the Kennedy report and kind of mash them together on a per square, per thousand square foot of wall basis. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, are there any other comments from uh, committee members this time? Go ahead, Michael. Sorry, I always have comments. Um, I did want to kind of ask some questions on the figures and tables at the end of the report in the appendix. Um, it, can you explain, it, it seems like you've gone through, of course, and, and have done different LCCAs and then provided different information. And those seem to have adjusted where some scenarios were better than others. And they are different from the original report. And then unless I'm getting the ones incorrect, it seems like there was a figure four, make sure I'm in the right reports, <laughs> make sure I don't have them backwards. Um, figure four is in one report, but it's not in the other as well. So I, can you explain a little bit on the LCCAs and the difference in outcome on what was the best scenario and how those changed and then maybe a explain where figure four is or what figure four is it fits in the new report. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, and sorry, do you want us to scroll up and just go to figure one and we can step down? Um, 
it's only, let me make sure I have the right appendices labeled here. It's only Appendix A that changed. So um, right. to catch Micah, uh, Appendix B and C are the same. So in Appendix A, figure one. So this is the um, heat pump water heating proposal. Um, so if we scroll down, as I mentioned before, we've updated the utility costs and the kind of real discount rate. Um, and so this is saying Alt-1, which is the gas Keep a water heating system. Um, obviously, the as before, the pure cost, um, it is cheaper system. Um, and then the including uh, social cost carbon now is showing um, improvement over the components proposal. So if you want to scroll down, um, what else I did in this revised uh, analysis is I pulled out the first pass through. We had one lump number. We just said a central heat pump water heater costs two hundred forty four thousand dollars incremental. Um, but I took the information already provided in Appendix C and just detailed out that we have three storage tanks, you know, two water heaters, and I gave a more uh, real replacement useful life for each component. Um, so it's same same information, just kind of a little bit more detailed. Um, if you go down to the Alt One. So can I? Yes. Can we go back before you go too far? Just because, yeah. and I'm and I'm sorry, I'm not an expert at this, Henry, but we yeah. have to vote on this in, in our best understanding. Could you scroll back up to Figure One, story in on on the first part of the appendix there? When I'm looking at the new information compared to the previous report, you're showing the nominal discount rate here of 5%. On the previous report, it was 3.14%. And then baseline for the social life cost was best in the previous scenario. So you scroll up just a little more. Now it's alternate one. And those numbers are significantly different from what the original report showed. Can you explain to me why that would be? Um, and when I say significantly, on the total LCC with SCC line um, on the social life cost here, you're showing about 980K or 980,000. On the previous report, that was almost 1.6 million. That's a huge shift in how did that adjust so significantly? Just, and why did that scenario, you know, alternate one now become the best scenario? Can you explain those? to us yeah. a little bit. And, and like I said, I'm not an expert. So <laughs> explaining these yeah. reports and, and maybe that'll help others as well. So we can make a, you know, a, a you know, a, a vote that means something. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the biggest change was the um, utility cost of natural gas uh, being 80 cents per therm. Originally it was closer to a dollar, which is the residential rate. And so this is when you're seeing the present value of utility costs as well as the social life cycle um, because the cost of natural gas was uh, significantly lower than the first pass. Um, it shows a better value for a gas system when you carry that out for 50 years. So that's just straight up utility cost, And then the discount rate, right? You know, the cost of something 50 years from now is uh, less now than it is in 50 years. Um, the total life cycle costs and probably the present value of capital costs, what you're seeing there, that fourth line in the LCCA. Um, what that's doing, um, it basically takes your replacement costs for your equipment. And so this is what I was just mentioning kind of briefly. The first pass, and Stoyan, if you want to scroll down to that input, um, hopefully we can do it without having both reports up. but. What this is doing here is you have each component. So when it says number of units, if there's a, a number there, it basically says we have two, two water heaters, three tanks, one backup, an electrical system, that useful life. Since this is a 50 year analysis, it says if you have two heat water heaters, it's useful life is 15 years. You're gonna have to replace that three times within this study. And so it actually takes account for equipment that fails, which is very valid or not fails, but end of life. Um, and so the first pass through this, basically what I had in there was one central heap of water heater that has a 15 
year life that costs $244,000. And so it said every 15 years, you need to spend another $244,000 in the study. And then it combines all that down into a net present value. What this does is that now I said, okay, we only have, you know, two even water years that cost, you know, 70,000 that I have to replace three times. The storage tanks is a, you know, $64,000 that only has to be replaced twice. And so when you have fewer replacement costs and regularity, when you combine all that back into a net present value of the system, it'll lower it between the two. Um, is that make sense to you? Yeah. Absolutely okay. does. Yes. Thank you. That's, okay. that's the type of information I was hoping to get from you, Henry. So I appreciate it. Um, yep. Just another final question on uh, the previous table on figure one. So if you just scroll back up, Stoyan. Could, so what is what is your inputs for the baseline in, in alternate one and alternate two? If, which Can you explain the baseline is what system? A gas system? Is alternate one a gas system? What are those uh, scenarios? The baseline, uh, baseline is going to be the heat pump water heater. And I'll sorry, just gonna make you scroll down again, but just so uh, you can all see it here. So baseline alternate one, you'll see right here, it says baseline input page at the top left. And then you'll see that anything that is a cost or an energy component, you'll see the line items there, um, heat pump water heater storage tank. So you, you can first, you can relate back to the executive summary by the title here, baseline input page. And if you scroll down again, you'll see an alternate one. And so this is how you can review uh, the next two as well. Uh, if you scroll down, we'll just walk through it then. If you want to scroll down to the CMD walls, you'll see Alt-1 is showing the best. And if you keep going, baseline input, you'll see it's the vermiculite 50%, which is the current code requirement. And a number of units is 1,000 square foot of wall. And it's a 51 year measure as most envelope measures are and if you scroll down to alt one it now goes to the continuous r 9.5 continuous thousand square foot of wall that has a useful life of 25 years um, which is a a good piece of uh, input from the kennedy report that these are a little more fragile than a cmu block um, same number of units and so then Executive summary will show that Alt-1 is still showing an improvement. And then if you want to go down one more, this should be the space heating. Um, it says baseline and is showing improvements. And then you'll see on the baseline input page, it's labeled VRF medium office. Number of units is the square footage of the prototype used in the energy modeling studies referenced. $24 a square foot was the approximate cost. And then if you go down to the Alt-1, it should be the same square footage, um, electric, gas, medium office, and then the energy, energy values are up in that top right corner. Um, and those are sourced from, if you want to scroll down one more, um, you can find this in the report that we referenced, but I figured I'd put it here just so um, it's a little bit more out in front. I think it's, if you scroll to the bottom of the figure, there you go, see Seattle, Washington is right where your cursor is. Um, it's not the most detailed modeling results, but um, you can scroll up to the top now and just kind of keep this in line. You can see uh, total megawatt hours of side energy. Um, it's about 150 megawatt hours, I think. Keep going. A little farther. There you go, total energy. So about 150, 100. Um, again, you can get in the report and see this a little clearer, but I figured I'd show it here in the report as well. Um, and this is same information, but we didn't have it referenced in the draft. Uh, so the percentages are the percentages above baseline or what are the percentages numbers there relate to? Am I missing so this, that? Uh, the study basically just looked at a modeling study of energy savings between 
a traditional VAV uh, system in a medium office versus VRF. It didn't have, um, it was not Washington specific. It was uh, obviously in every climate zone here. And so um, this was just an overall uh, modeling study to see um, system type savings. Thank you. Yep. And then the next two appendices are the same unchanged from the previous report. And uh, they just highlight some of our um, mainly heap of water heating costs and energy analysis. Um, but again, that's the same as before. Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> um, any other questions or comments from committee members? I, I did have one more. No, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Uh, I, so if we could go back, sorry to make you scroll, Stoyan, if we can go back to figure one, since that seems to be just the, the starting point for everything. Um, so what your report is indicating is, is that for cost, it does seem like the baseline of these proposals is going to be more expensive. And so that's what you're accurately showing here is the best cost is what you're indicating best in, in let's just say column three um, for alternate one, that, that's the cost only. That, that's not the best system necessarily, that's just the best cost over the life cycle. Is, is that a correct assumption? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and so over the life cycle, yes, these will increase cost and you're indicating that the numbers here are how much that increase would be based um, Compared, compared between the two. Yeah, and I guess I could have made it a little more consistent between each one, like maybe the baseline could have been 2018, but if, yeah, hopefully you can kind of track now how it's looking. Sure. This one, the baseline is the code proposal, the heap of water okay. heating, and alt one is the current uh, practice as usual. Okay. Thank you. I, and that, that helps me correlate how this, um, ties into the proposals and the economic impact on the proposals and your summary of those above. So thank you for the information here. I really appreciate you being here because this would have made no sense otherwise. <laughs> so really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And if you look at the heat pump water heating analysis way up at the very top or kind of wrote it out, I put a quick summary, um, all of our costs and energy assumptions was based off of a 173 unit prototype, I believe. And so I took what that incremental cost was and divided by 173 units. And I think it's somewhere around $1,800 per dwelling unit. If you want a slightly more nimble number to throw around. Where do you want me to go? What uh, very top, basically, probably page. PDF page six. Oh, sorry, PDF page five. Oh, uh, I guess that would be for you, it'd be eight. Okay. All right, so. That one? Oh, man. It's in there somewhere, sorry. Um, No, it's it's in there. Sorry, if you go to just the heap of water heating. It's section, the bottom of page five. Yeah. There you go. So right there, LCC rates, so solar incremental cost of eighteen hundred per dwelling unit, and four hundred when accounting for social cost of carbon. So just pulling that uh, figure one results out on a normalized per dwelling unit basis for this. Again, for the single prototype, just a one multifamily building um, you know, does not capture right across the state or um, uh, city of Seattle, King County already requires this as well. So um, not normalized across the entire um, market. Okay. 
Any other questions or comments from committee members? Go ahead, Caroline. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, thanks, Henry. I guess, you know, I think we iterated this last time, but it's a, you know, it's a tough, a tough ask and it's a good review approach to a, a difficult task. So appreciative of that. Um, you know, I think in the last meeting, I'd asked some questions specifically about the heat pump space heating analysis. So appreciate to see that updated LCCA into um, the appendix uses that alternative data source. And I guess lastly, my question for you, right, these types of studies, as you've kind of alluded to, are like largely a function of what the selection of the baseline system is and or which prototypes are chosen and using average costs and utility rates. And I guess, you know, I think as how we consider this report, you know, as one of several data points along with all of the public comment and written testimony that we've received over, you know, the last 12 months or so. Um, yeah, just curious if you could put into context a bit about how, how you would leverage this information, I guess, kind of given that selection of baselines and isolated prototypes and like factor that in um, to the larger decision that needs to be made. Um. Yeah, it's a tough. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's a tough one to take into account. But what I can kind of relate to is we did a modeling study for the state looking at the impact of the code, um, the 2018 code compared to the baseline. And so we actually did go through the exercise of looking at, um, you know, building surveys, uh, CBSA, RBSA, uh, building stock assessments, and actually trying to weight where the buildings are being built and the overall, you know, quantity by floor area. Um, so that way you can kind of pull um, specifics like these findings. Um, you could say if it costs 800 per dwelling, 1800 per dwelling unit. Um, actually, in our study that we published, we have a couple summary tables that show what is the total, like, uh, sorry, I'm trying to say this in a simple way. Um, we basically decided that through looking at um, census data and some uh, building surveys that roughly 75% of um, commercial buildings are built in climate zone 4C. And so that way you could kind of get a sense for energy consumption between the two climate zones. Um, I forget the exact number, but maybe something like 8% of the total floor area um, in Washington state is a mid-rise multifamily building. And so you can use that kind of information to keep weighting this individual building level data down. Um, and you can kind of see, I guess from an energy, it, it wasn't a cost study. So using kind of that general information would probably be a method to pull individual analysis like that. Um, ideally, what our original thought with this third party cost uh, benefit analysis was to pick out um, the building types that are most common or either the biggest energy users or the most commonly built in the state. Um, so, and if you scroll up to that figure of figures, if you go up a little bit. Right here? Um, One more? No, if you keep, yeah, go up to like the table of contents. Oh, table of contents. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be summary of uh, table 11. Table 11. Pretty far down. Um, yeah, again, this was just a modeling study for energy, what we're looking at here, but there's some good um, kind of uh, fundamental uh, assumptions and uh, kind of weightings that um, aren't impacted here. So this is kind of what I was getting at. Um, our analysis, like for the space heating pools, we just looked at the medium office. Um, you could assume that similar cost per square foot um, for all offices, maybe not a high rise, but 
if you take that, you'll see that 20% of the floor area is showing that it's um, a cost benefit for heat pump space heating from our analysis. So while it's only one building type, uh, one HVAC system, you know, we've captured, you know, 15, 20% of the impacted uh, building types. That could be a method to extrapolate some of our findings. Uh, the mid-rise apartment, um, as I mentioned, is the biggest end user of um, uh, domestic hot water uh, heating. Um, that's, you know, 6%, but then you can also see that, um, you know, hotels or if you scroll down, there's other apartment styles in there as well. Um, so you can use that to see what building types are most impacted. Um, maybe calibrate across the state. This doesn't really pull out, as I mentioned, the Seattle area, Seattle Energy Code specific requirements. Um, our census data show that 75% lives in 4C, which includes obviously the entire north south of um, Washington. So we can't really say that 75% of the multifamily buildings already have heat pump water heating, but just as a rough guide, you can kind of start there and assume Seattle King County has a large percentage of that compared to Bellingham or um, Vancouver or something. So maybe a bit long winded, but maybe that helps a little bit. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, there's good good data in here that kind of can help paint a picture for the overall um, state, whereas the cost benefit was building the building. Okay, Todd, go ahead. Oh, thank you. And I, I think all my most of my questions were already answered. So it was a perfect question, Caroline. And 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 thank you for the the answer there. My question was, is this pulling from the commercial building stock assessment, the NIA the NIA documents? Um, and, and you're showing right now it is. Why was it 2014? Was this study put together before the 2019 data became available? Just just really getting into the weeds on how when we get questions, especially about you know, I represent the east side and, and you know, I've had you know, our local jurisdiction ask, you know, try to better understand how they can be more restrictive, obviously, in the energy code in Washington, right? Um, they're trying to understand this better, what percentage of this really represents our, our area, our city, our county, and so forth. Um, yes, this should have been completed before the 2019 data was finalized. Am and I? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say in that, though, if I remember correctly, isn't it in that survey and that methodology, can't we start to put more um, localized um, percentages based on jurisdiction? Or am I just diving too deep into, into this interpretation? Um, I'm sure you could. This report, right, this was put out several years ago, so we're not actively updating it. Um, okay. If there's an opportunity to do this again, we could we would definitely consider those kind of changes. Yep. No, thank you. It's not a criticism of, of the scope of this. I just think it's a scope that in the future could be valuable to us to to answer those questions, especially when we'll we'll get plenty of comments on the two different climate zones and east side versus west side. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. Anything further from committee members? Okay, with that, we'll open it up to public comment. Uh, reminder to those um, representing the public, uh, please keep your, your comments to uh, limited to changes from the previous draft or new information. Larry, go ahead. Larry Andrews. Can you hear me now? You're good. Okay. On page three, could he bring up page three? Okay. Page three. Um, the one thing that I see here is, I mean, this whole focus was to validate what was there instead of finding out the truth. But then if you go down below and you look at the, the year that this rate was pulled from 2017 and 2018, I mean, we, we know what the rates are now. We knew what them they were in 21. And so the rates aren't even in the ballpark right now. Then we talked about 
the carbon footprint for the gas, but we didn't put any input in here for the carbon footprint for the electricity. Okay, in the east side here, we have a lot of gas turbines that bring on our electricity and there should have been some input in there on the electrical side for the carbon footprint. Then if we look on page four, if we could go down to page four, we got to remember that this cost effective study was from a California study where their areas are zone three and zone four. Now, if you take the same thing up here, I mean, in Spokane, we're in zone five, but Colville's zone six. And uh, and so is Newport, Washington is zone six. So I, I really don't think this California study is accurate in cold climates. And I'll go into more detail in a few seconds on that. But then if we go down to the second paragraph, you see where it says, while this HVAC system is common in retail and then warehouses. Well, in the Spokane area, on your uh, analysis here, I mean, we don't... That. this is all the same. That was in the first draft. None of this is different. Um, okay. The, so I just but, want to kind of help out the, the council here. Okay. But, but the thing about warehouses is we don't have any AC usage to speak of in our warehouses over here. Then if we go down to the bottom paragraph here, it says um, heat pumps and upsize of electrical panels may be needed. Well, it's going to, it will be needed. And then it says, and it's, it's a significant number, not a little number. Then it also says that, um, that the ducts and pipes would be about the same. Well, that's not true. I mean, if you're gonna run heat pumps down to a low factor, you're gonna have significant duct size and pipe size. And if you look at the price of insulation to go around those ducts, plus the cost, you got some significant numbers there that wasn't inputted. Then if we go to page five, it says here, um, and I'm, I'm on the 136 heat pump water heating. OK, and it says as well as the most complicated system. Well, they use an apartment building and that apartment building is not anywhere close to a complicated system. What what a real complicated system is, is when you're delivering about three different water temperatures out to the facility that you're serving. And in an apartment building, you're only delivering one temperature. OK, and then we don't have anything to do with 130 degree and over water in this system. And and in most of the applications, and if you look in the Mitsubishi water heaters, the new ones that are out, I mean, they can't even get to 180 degrees with the outside temperature. In fact, the Mitsubishi people tell you they, they don't recommend you even trying to do this. So that means all the water above 130, you're gonna to have to have straight electric or gas to, to bring that water temperature up. Now we're talking about the restaurants out there and uh, like close to 600,000 BTUs of heat that's required to do this. So then, so then they talk about on the next page, on page six, it says while HPW plants generally require more floor space, which they do by dramatically three times the space. And I don't believe that cost was put in for the extra building cost. But then it says these plants may be located on a roof. That ain't going to happen in Spokane because you're going to freeze or unusual portions of the garage. Well, we're talking here. These people are, are mainly talking about apartments here. And, and, and this is commercial. That's just a small part of commercial, okay? We have retirement centers that got to have 180 degree water for the laundry, 180 degree water for the uh, kitchen. And then we've got to have 120, really about 117 degree water going out to the residence for wash. 
because you can't even have 120 degree out there. So, so we got major mixing stations that are involved. So a huge amount of cost. And then if you look at the size of the rooms that are existing, you could never even come close to putting any of this stuff in there, okay? So then if we go down a little bit further, it says gas water heatings should include the gas distributing piping, okay? Well, that's not how gas has been put in this state and this state's regulated beyond belief. What the load of the gas is dictated on how much the service would cost. If you have adequate load, they don't charge you for any extra on the service because you're using so much. And then when I started to look, it, it's, it, we start at a 1500 gallon tank, then we went to a 2000 gallon tank, then I'm on page 30 and 31, they're not marked. If you could go to the two pages that aren't marked. And let's take a look at those pages. Larry. Okay. Yeah. What's your time frame on this? Because I, we uh, gotta get we gotta be able to get to all the public yeah, comments. Yeah, so we can't yeah, yeah, but, yeah, I only got about another two minutes here to okay. bring out the glaring errors. But okay. So if you go, I call it page 30. It says base for HPD HPW cost. Okay. So if you look down there, and 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 the thing about it is is there's no load that's told in these papers what the total load is okay so you got to kind of guesstimate what it is so i took two mitsubishi uh the latest heaters out uh co2 heat pumps and i unplugged the load in there so when you unplug the load in there and it says here service distribution of 400 amp panel well when you add all the loads in there you got 357 amps and then Washington State code requires a 1.2 multiplier, 1.25 multiplier on that load. So there's no way that you can run a 400 amp service on that number one. You're into a minimum of a 600 amp service, okay? So that means multiple panels. If you have more than six throws, that means a distribution center. Now we're talking some real bucks here. So then the final thing that I really looked at, and like I'm calling, let's get to the last page here, page 31, okay? Now, this is what I mean. You don't know what the load is, but the gas water heater has 288,000 BTUs if you use their 80%, which I would never do. But then you look at the electric resistance. Now we've all dropped now down to a 500 amp, 500 gallon tank. I don't know how you're ever gonna do that with a CO2 system. But so if you look at, if you progress the 35 kW and you multiply it out, that only gives you 119,420 BTUs, okay? Now, if you look at the gas water heater plant, he's given him 288,000 BTUs. So then if you look at the CO2 plant, he's given him 211, 211 544,000 BTUs. So there's no apples to apples here, okay? It, it, it's, it's, it's just not true. And if you, were, if you were gonna really do this, you don't even need the 500 gallon water heater in the gas system. If you go with a PVI 95% gas water heater, you can put, a million and a half BTUs in that room that only takes a 36 inch foot pr footprint and it'll adjust all the way down to 200,000 BTUs from 200,000 to a million five, okay? And that water heater will be here in 20 years, okay? It's ASME approved. So when you look at these numbers here and then if you progress the amount of power that went to these numbers, their whole thing is out the door because they're, I mean, you got half of the electric, straight electric, and you got more than double the gas input with the same amount of tanks. And then somewhere in between, you got the CO2, which should have the largest tank by far. But now let's really talk about the CO2 input here. Larry, I got to get to other public comments. I, I know, but you need to hear this because the CO2, when the temperature out here is five degrees, only puts out 40% of its input. So you can never do what he wants to do at, these, at this rate. 
he doesn't have the power there to do it because he needs more machines because the outside temperature is such that he can't put out the BTUs he was putting out. Thank so you, this Larry. whole studies is a farce. Thank you, okay. Larry. Tim, You're welcome. Ahead. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, th this is uh, Tim Atterbury with the Associated General Contractors of Washington. We represent all the commercial construction firms in the state. Um, you know, Larry, Larry did a good job there, and I think people need to really pay attention to what, what he just uh, provided. Um, what, what I was going to say, as far as the thoroughness of this report, I think that it would have been smart to, to have a survey of five to ten developers and maybe five to ten pre-construction folks that work for commercial construction firms, folks that actually do cost estimating all day, every day. And, and just had, the, had those folks survey this information to make sure it's legitimate. I, I, I think if you had five to 10 developers and five to 10 construction firms look at this, it would have been way more valuable and it would help you leverage this information that's in front of you um, because those eyes need to be on this. Um, they, they work in the real world. Um, they, they, they have to put pen to paper and, and there's a point for every developer, there's sort of a tipping point for every developer as far as whether or not it makes sense to go forward with a project. And, and I'm worried that we don't have firm numbers that they can kind of um, rest on. And then there was another comment um, made a, a couple of times that had me concerned that, you know, Seattle and King County are already doing this. And, 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 and just, just common sense tells me that, you know, developers in Seattle and King County have deeper pockets. And so absorbing costs like this is not that big of a deal to them. In the suburbs, in the rural areas, um, developers don't have as deep of pockets. I mean, a, a lot of developers doing work in, in the city of Seattle, those are international investors. They're, they're folks from out of state. Um, that, that, that have deeper pockets. So I, I'm just worried that uh, we're glossing over something when we say, you know, Seattle King County is already doing this. So no problem for the rest of the state. I don't think that's true. So I, I, I guess I, I kind of want to open that up to committee members as far as whether or not you think it would be valuable for you when you're making a vote on Friday to, to have five to 10 local developers, you know, be surveyed and then also some pre-construction folks who do daily cost estimating for construction firms, you know, for them to, to be surveyed, to, to talk, to, to speak to some of the issues that Larry discussed. Thank you, Tim. I'll open it back up to committee after public comment. Uh, Tom Young, go ahead. There we go. Good morning, everyone. I uh, appreciate all the uh, council members attending today to hear this discussion. Um, in terms of concrete, ma the concrete masonry issue, and I'll be specific to that, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a flawed report. It should be rejected by the council. And I'll give you some reasons why. Uh, the problem is you can't take bad data. We have bad cost data and bad energy use data in the Kennedy report and apply it to a new report and expect to get true, accurate information. It just doesn't work. Um, the old report, the Kennedy report is from 2014. There was a failed attempt made to adjust some of these uh, construction costs. The information uh, is even acknowledged by Ecotope that the Kennedy report is unclear and can't be validated. And yet it was that information was taken and moved forward into this. Excuse me, this Tom, that's false. I was saying the report was hard to track and we found it and provided a link. We did not talk about the substance of the report at all. So that is an incorrect statement. No, I'm just quoting from the report that, that you said it's unclear and can't be validated. If you'd like, we could go. Do you want to go line by line in the report? I'm just quoting from the report there. Uh, we can find that if you'd like. I don't know. Um, if you look at page nine, for example, I guess we need to go to that much detail. Sorry for that, Mr. Chairman, but um, can you look at page nine, please? Under energy analysis.
and move up uh, a little bit, please. There we go. So we're looking at uh, energy analysis comments. If you look at the first item, therefore savings claimed in this co-proposal cannot be validated. It talks about unclearness uh, in another location. So I'm just quoting the report there. Um, so you've taken this old information, you've tried to move it forward into a new report. Um, as the gentleman from AGC just commented, the, the cost information is completely out of line here. It is so low, it is ridiculous. Uh, if you look at the uh, LCA numbers, they're using $4.29 a square foot for a complete system of adding insulation and uh, framing to the interior of a concrete block wall, sheetrock on top of that. Um, I have done what the gentleman recommended. I have talked to local cost estimators. I've talked to uh, several of them. I've got estimates from them. And that $4.29 is not anywhere near accurate. It's, it should be somewhere between $9 to $13 a square foot. So there's a big problem there. Uh, that was not addressed in the update. And I brought this up initially. If you look at the energy side of it too, there's something wrong here. The modeling, there's some modeling concerns because the results are unreasonable. Uh, we've done a lot of modeling over the years. I've seen modeling done on mass wall systems, such as those that are permitted by the current uh, code exception. And of course it isn't all building types uh, by any means, but these numbers don't make sense. In fact, you could actually do a simple straightforward UA Delta T calculation and get better results than we're seeing from this supposed modeling study that was done. So there's there's something wrong there. It's not reasonable. It's certainly not a holistic analysis uh, when you're just looking at a portion of a building and, and it probably should be. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, the Equitope report states that they reached similar results on proposal 208 as the proponent and that's not true. The proponent found that in his LCCA that the single wife exposed block wall integral insulated was the best choice from a cost effectiveness standpoint and not, not the alternative one. And it doesn't add up either because uh, the Ecotope group actually added some additional costs to their study, which is the replacement of the drywall, which should be looked at at 25 years. And if you do that, you should actually get the baseline wall without the drywall should actually show even better than before. So they reach an opposite conclusion by adding more costs to the alternative that uh, they're saying now is the best choice. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. Additionally, they use one LCCA for two code proposals, which also doesn't seem to be a logical way to handle this. So what I found, if you use accurate cost data, and you actually include another thing that's missing is maintenance, not just replacement. Drywall is going to need maintenance in these high use building applications that are permitted by the code. And so you're going to need to include that. If you include accurate costs, you include maintenance. And even if you accept the uh, questionable energy use data that I've just talked about, you still find that the baseline integral insulated CMU wall is the best choice, is the most cost effective option. And that's the same result as the proponents LCA a that was done uh, initially. So we do find consistency there, at least in that at that point. So I do like the report correctly states that this is just one component uh, for the council to make their decision. Um, I think rejecting this report still will leave you ample information to make a good uh, and correct decision. On this issue, I could I could certainly go on uh, and add more, but what I'll do is just close by saying I would urge all the council members to uh, read the written testimony, the extensive written testimony provided by our industry, and uh, hopefully most of you heard our oral testimony on this subject as well. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Elizabeth, we're uh, running out of time here, so. Okay, thank you. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, my name is Elizabeth Joyce. I'm a senior mechanical engineer at AIRUP, which is a consulting engineering firm here in Seattle. Um, and I'm making comments on the uh, to share some new information relevant to the heat pump space heating and heat pump water heating proposals. Um, I'm on the energy code tag and I participated in the tag process, so I'm familiar with these proposals already. Um, the new information that I wanted to share is that 
Arup just completed, um, we released just like a week or two ago, a study with um, the New Buildings Institute, NBI, looking at the incremental costs associated with building electrification, um, one associated with codes. Uh, this particular study, we looked at the IECC 2021 baseline, which of course the Washington State Energy Code is based on, um, and looked at the uh, all-inclusive costs associated with building electrification for a medium office prototype and a single family residential prototype. Um, costs included, you know, not only heat pump water heating and heat pump space heating equipment, but then all relevant other building systems such as electrical infrastructure, uh, electrical service, piping and pipe insulation, metering, sensors, etc. Um, we looked at climate zone five to address kind of wide northern applicability. Um, and looked at both mixed fuel sort of electric ready as well as all electric uh, prototypes for our study. Um, put together the systems designs and then had our cost estimators put together the cost estimates. Um, costs, of course, are fully burdened, inclusive of labor, et cetera. And the results that we found were that the incremental cost of electrification, even when incorporating other systems um, and adjustments to systems in the building and infrastructure, um, were modest for you know, a medium office prototype we looked at about 50,000 square foot. Um, we found that the mixed fuel uh, incremental cost was around the range of a dollar to a dollar 20 a square foot. Um, and the all electric incremental cost was about 33 cents to 50 cents a square foot. Elizabeth. Um, Yes, so we need committee action to extend the meeting, and so I have to do that first. And so oh, we, sorry, we were scheduled to eleven thirty. So, uh, okay. We, um, well, then I'll I'll stop and say, um, you know, again, as I said, the incremental okay. costs that okay. we found were point. modest okay. when compared Let's with just, other costs associated with the um, the construction. Yeah, and I I'm happy to share a link to the report if desired. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just need to extend the meeting, then you can keep going. So. That's all. So I just need to, um, we'll make a motion to extend the meeting. Um, let's go um, 11.45. You think we can get 11.50? I say noon. Noon? Okay. Noon. Extend. So moved. Okay, thank you, Chell. I'll second that. Do we have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Motion carries. Floor is yours, Elizabeth. All right, thank you. Um, so just to wrap up my comments, um, like I said, I can share a link to the report if desired. It's it's public, it's available online. Um, but again, you know, the, the first costs, incremental costs associated with electrification um, for space heating, water heating, um, were modest, you know, on the scale of a few percent of the total MEP system cost. And for new construction, the cost of avoided gas infrastructure for all electric buildings can offset the incremental costs of additional electric infrastructure, you know, service, et cetera. Um, you know, and a final comment to consider is that electric readiness, you know, for a mixed fuel building can offset or help to offset future costs for upgrades in buildings that may be retrofit later, since, you know, later on the cost to retrofit can be more expensive since you have to go into an existing building. So doing it at the start um, can be cheaper overall. Um, that's my comments. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sorry about that. I just, just needed to get that out of the way, that extension. Uh, let's go with Adam, then we'll jump to Larry. Hello, council members. Thank you for letting us speak today. I just had one question mainly for Henry uh, on the report. Do we, uh, does this report utilize uh, hour by hour data uh, when looking at buildings and for their mass walls for uh, the, the CME wall proposals? Yeah, so we didn't complete any uh, modeling study ourselves. Uh, we did reference uh, the Kennedy report, and from my experience, with him, okay. he uses eQuest, which is a 8760 program. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that uh, masonry mass walls uh, do benefit from a time lag uh, release of energy into the building, offsetting peak energy usage in the building to uh, non peak used uh, usage time. Uh, and that in turn saves us uh, energy in heating our building building or cooling it as well as uh, storing cooling uh, loads from the walls and releasing them throughout the building uh, uh, as the as the outside temperature increases uh, throughout the day and in turn saving us energy overall um, i just wanted to point that out as as one of the main uh, 
talking points of that are not addressed in this report is that we we do benefit from a, uh, our mass walls and and should get some value out of that in uh, in any cost savings data. Um, as Tom has said in the past, uh, we have had cost studies done that look at a whole building modeling approach uh, and have shown that the, the cost savings due to that time temperature lag uh, has actually saved us uh, significant return on, uh, on providing inter in integral insulated masonry walls rather than inter interior insulated walls. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Johnny, did you have public comment? I saw yeah, you. I just wanted to uh, speak um, in favor of the modified um, cost benefit analysis. Um, I know that Ecotip did a, a lot of work on this. I know there was a lot of analysis of my initial um, uh, life cycle cost analysis, uh, analysis that was submitted at the beginning of the uh, heat pump proposal process, and um, they uh did a really great job um finding um where the places in which i had made errors and correcting them and providing um, supplemental information to basically indicate that you know uh, HEPA proposals still do um stand and um their energy and cost savings are uh evident based on analysis that was done so i would like to um thank you for the work that they did and um yeah, just want to support it. Thank you, John. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, I got three minor comments here. Uh, one of the things is, is, and I don't think you've talked about this yet, but the EPA has said in uh, commercial buildings, our CO2 input for Washington State is only 6.23% of the total C CO2 for for Washington State. So we're talking a small fraction here. And then I want to address the mass walls thing. The mass wall in there shows a 51 year, okay? Shadel Park High School was built in 1957. It has high mass walls. It was redone about five years ago, but all the mass walls stayed, okay? And so if you're really looking at mass walls, you should be looking at least a hundred year package here because that wall will be here in a hundred years, just like North Central High School was here. And then the final comment is, the other thing that I don't like about the EcoTorp report is, on, is, is the maintenance. They put zero amount for maintenance in here for the heat pumps and the gas. The heat pumps in our area is about five times the cost of maintenance versus a gas air conditioner. And I wanna explain why. We only run air conditioner in Spokane for about two months out of the year, okay? So 10 months out of the year, that compressor is sitting there and those controls are sitting there doing nothing, okay? But that heat pump system is working 24 seven every day of the year, okay? They are a high maintenance item. If we don't keep those coils clean, we lose the compressors. And if you look at the data that I originally put in, you can see that there is some real significant cost in our area for heat pumps. And the reason why is, is because we have the Palouse. And the Palouse here, they go out there and they drag their plows out there and they stir up all the dust. And all that dust comes in here and deposits into those coils. And if we're not regularly cleaning those coils two to three times a year, our performance factor goes through the roof, down through the bottom. And then also is we lose compressors here a lot. And that's attributed to dirty condensers that are seeing high head pressures with high, head, high temperatures. So that is a significant cost here that sh that's not been addressed in this report. Thank you for taking your time to listen to me. Thank you, Larry. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Tim Atterbury with the Associated General Contractors of Washington. Again, 
Um, what we've learned from the last hour is there's a lot of debate on cost. <laughs> I mean, everyone who's spoken up in the last hour um, has, a, has a different number on cost. And so I just want to suggest to council members that, that um, in, until there's consensus from, from all the different groups on cost, I don't think you guys should make a decision on this. It, it's too big of a deal. You would never buy a house or a car not knowing the final cost. And so I just wanna, I just wanna put that red flag uh, out there as far as maybe we don't need to vote on Friday. Maybe we can put this off and have a group come together um, to talk about cost because there's so much debate on cost and there's a lot of good input from all sides on cost. So I just wanna, I wanna pump the brakes here and say, maybe we don't need to make a decision on Friday. Maybe we um, put together a committee that comes to consensus on costs because I, I, I just, I know that all the council members that are listening right now in their personal life, you would never buy something not knowing the final cost. And that's what we're asking folks to do here. And we're making a big decision. And I, I just think we need consensus on cost. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Uh, let's open it. Is there any other public comment at this time? Okay, let's open it back up to the committee. Is there any committee members with comments at this time? Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to bring up the, 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 the law that tells us what to do with costs as the, as the council. Um, it says, and this is RCW 1927A025, non-residential buildings cost effectiveness. Part B, any new measure standards or requirements adopted must be technically feasible, commercially available, and developed to yield the overall lowest overall cost to the building owner and occupant while meeting the energy reduction of goals established under RCW 1927A160. And, and so these code proposals do not need to be cost effective in that every single one of them gives you more dollars back than you had in the first place. Um, we have a, a mandate to meet a certain energy reduction goal and the council is to put together a package that, that is the lowest cost to yield um, a, a or to, to get a code to get there. And the, you know, the council spent a lot of time, the tags and the MV committee putting together a package of technically feasible um, proposals that are, you know, the package of proposals that, that can get us there. There were no other proposals that, that could get us to the energy reduction targets uh, that, that didn't include what the TAG recommended to the MVE and the MVE recommended to the council. So I wanted to put this, this whole cost effectiveness thing in context because some of the, some of the letters that critiqued the ecotope analysis um, didn't seem to have understand that that was that was actually the, the the test the council test for cost effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Mike, go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate all the public comments and, and questions. I still have some of my own on the report, um, at least based on you know what is baseline, what is alternative one. Um, I mean, when we look at the figure one for the heat pump information for water heating, uh, it shows that it's going to be more cost up front to put these systems in. But as Chael mentioned, this is the most cost effective path to achieve the goals that are set by legislative mandate. It doesn't mean it's the cheapest way to, the, to the cheapest system to install, but it is the most cost effective path. And that was a great point, Chael, to make on this, um, I think that's a really important one to remember. I don't believe that the report is inaccurate. It is showing that there is increased cost there, um, that there were some inaccuracies in the proposals. Um, I think that was brought up by, by one of the public comments where they talked about uh, they couldn't verify a report. Well, that was identified as a deficiency in the proposal, not a deficiency from Ecotope, and Ecotope did do some adjustments to that to, to make some uh, clarifications there and recommended those. So 
I think the report is as accurate as possible based on the information that we have. Um, it may not be as accurate as possible for every scenario, especially those ones that maybe Larry had indicated. Um, but again, it is the probably the best balance for cost effectiveness moving forward. Uh, so I still have some questions and, and maybe that could be something we can note in the future that, um, and, and I think Henry mentioned that, that maybe the baseline should be the 2008, or, you know, the, the current code changes and then the alternative will be the, the new code changes. Um, so just something to keep in mind, but I, I do think that this is, as Jill mentioned, the best overall path forward when it comes to looking at cost. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Stoyan, if you have something to address on that, that would be great. Also, just for clarification purposes, um, will you please clarify for the committee what our role is today as far as pushing this to council for them to ultimately adopt? And if we do that, um, I'm not seeing that specifically on the agenda for Friday as far as the report goes, the final report, unless that's part of the um, the motion to adopt on agenda item number nine. It was never planned for the council to adopt or not adopt the, the uh, final uh, cost benefit analysis. So the council can vote on it uh, in order to uh, uh, use it or not. But uh, what I said at the beginning, we started with the preliminary cost benefit analysis. We were asked to hire a third party. We did have the contract with Ticotop. Uh, and uh, they developed their version of it and we will add our comments and this is all for the council to evaluate when the council members are making their decisions. If the council disagree with the report, then we need to develop something else. Understood. Okay, so as uh, far as is, the action today, is it us pushing it to council to make that decision? You can, you, you have a few options. Uh, just do nothing because the reason for this group was to uh, coordinate the effort and, and uh, have the public input and have the input from the members of this uh, work group of economic impact and uh, help Ecotop make adjustments uh, to the reports. Uh, or you can uh, recommend the council to take the report as part of the final cost benefit analysis, or you can say we don't recommend it, it's 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 up to you. But yeah. the, the initial intent for this group wasn't to make a decision, the initial intent was to uh, coordinate the process. Okay, Caroline, go ahead. Yeah, I guess just a, a clarification there, Stoyan, like the report we have at this moment is not the final report, because that report can only exist after adoption of an energy. Yeah. That's correct. Yes, this is a draft. Okay. Again, I, I wasn't clear. I, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. So this is the report, the final draft for the council that they can use when they are voting on uh, the energy code proposals. Right. So it seems right. like it's one additional piece of information along with a magnitude of other information to be considered in decisions for Friday. But I guess, Tony, leave it up to you if you think a vote on it is necessary at this point. Okay. Story, do you have anything else to add before we look for a motion? As a personal, if you are asking me for a, a personal opinion as being the, the managing director, again, the vote for this group never was the intent. And my recommendation was just, uh, you, you can have a vote if you want, but that's the document for the council that will be attached to the rest of the document and uh, the documents and this is for the council members to take into uh, consideration. Saying taking this into consideration doesn't mean uh, adopt it or, or approve it. Taking into consideration could be, I don't like it or I love it, you know. Understood. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, and, and this is not exactly on the topic we were just talking about, but I wanted to address Tim's comment about additional cost information. And um, this is, you know, getting towards the end of a 16 month rulemaking process for which we had, we've had lots of input and um, we always want more data points. So, so Tim, we had um, Eric Bedell of GLY on the tag and we have other people on the tag that have relationships with the contracting and subcontracting industries. And we love to get more data points so that we can make 
really informed decisions. So the residential code is starting up um, really soon and the commercial code will start up again, not in too long in the future. So um, please, please be very engaged in that. Thank you, Joe, Micah. <clears throat> I think you're still on mute. Micah, go ahead. I think we lost Micah. Sorry, I think I'm back. There you go. Okay, now we can see and hear you. Go ahead. That was, uh, it kicked me off all of a sudden. That was really strange. Um, I, I, Based on Stoney's recommendation, I don't see a need for our committee to provide a motion on this since there's no action required. Um, I believe the SBCC is just required to provide a report on an economic impact report based off of the uh, findings from the proposals and adjustments made by the individual group making the report, which would be Ecotope, third party. Um, again, I don't. I don't believe that uh, we need to take any action. So I will not be making a motion. Just that was it. Okay. And I did also agree with Chael on addressing some of Tim's comments. I, I, I meant to talk about the consensus part of it on getting a consensus on cost impact and the cost. I don't think that's possible in my opinion. I mean, every, every group is gonna have, I mean, every construction company is gonna have different margins they're going to pay their folks differently. I just, I don't know if you could ever come to an agreement on cost or, or even maintenance cost, uh, anything like that. So again, I think we're providing a report um, through a third party and we are meeting the obligations of the RCW and the bylaws for the SBCC. And I don't see an action necessary. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Micah. I agree. I don't know that any action is necessary on this item. Um, Okay, anything else from committee members? Okay, so Larry, if you can exercise brevity on this, that would be great, but go ahead. Uh, I just wanna talk about Shale's comment about the tag. And I've talked to the people that came from the east side here about the tag and how the tag was ran and uh, and they, they, they kept putting up different ideas, but the tag was dominated by the West side. Point of order, it, Larry, I'm sorry, but this, that's not the time for this comment. And so we can't, we can't, we're not gonna go down that road right now. So with that, is there any other uh, committee members with um, on item number four, as far as it'll come up. Uh, comments? If not, we'll move on to item number five, which is other business. Does anyone have any other business committee members? Okay, excellent. With that, make a motion to adjourn and we'll see you all Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>